Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending upon where you are in the world, and welcome to today's webinar, Scaling Software-Defined Networking, or SDN, Applications with the MOSIS Virtualized Accelerator Engine, brought to you by Tech Online, MOSIS, and broadcast by Aspen Core. I'm Chris Keach, and I'll be your moderator today. We have just a few brief announcements before we begin. First, the slides will advance automatically throughout the event. You may also download a copy of the slides by clicking on the green folder icon located at the bottom of your screen. You can participate in our Q&A session by asking questions at any time during this webinar. Just type your question into the Q&A text area located to the right of the presentation window and then click the Submit button. Please note that we'll try to get to as many questions as we can at the end of today's webinar. However, if we're unable to get to your question today, someone will get back to you after the program is over. Also at this time, we recommend that you disable your computer's pop-up blockers. This will allow the slides to advance automatically throughout the event. And at the end of the webinar, we will ask you to complete our feedback form. Your feedback will provide us with valuable information on how we can improve future events. You can also launch the survey at any time by clicking on the red survey button at the bottom of your console. And if you're experiencing any technical problems, please type your issue into the Q&A text area and we will be glad to offer one-on-one -on -one assistance. And now on to the presentation. Scaling Software Defined Networking, or SDN, applications with the MOSIS Virtualized Accelerator Engine. Discussing today's topic is Michael Miller, Chief Technical Officer at MOSIS. MOSIS Chief Technical Officer Mr. Miller brings more than 30 years of experience in technology innovation, system architecture, and software to MOSIS. Prior to joining MOSIS, he held the position of Chief Technical Officer, Systems Architecture for Integrated Device Technology Incorporated. It's with great pleasure I now turn this special session over to Michael to begin. Michael, take it away. Yeah, thank you, Chris. So uh, as Chris mentioned, we're going to talk about the Virtual Accelerator Engine. Um, it's actually technology, and we have several different products uh, within that area, and I will introduce that product uh, in this uh, particular family area. So to begin with, uh, virtualization uh, has something that's been going on for a long time in our industry. Um, I would define that as the replication of hardware resources uh, via software. And typically what it's uh, meant to do is ease the deployment of uh, a solution uh, within a uh, na network, data center, whatever, and improve the hardware utilization of that particular equipment. You know, to begin with, you know, going back uh, a few decades, uh, this technology or approach was uh, implemented in order to share CPUs. I mean, CPUs used to be a big computer in a room and maybe one person programming it, and it was hard to, you know, justify that and, in essence, get return on uh, investment. So we developed things like uh, time-sharing techniques uh, and in infrastructure, so multiple programmers and users could share the uh, machine at the same time. And then we did the same thing with storage. Uh, we, you know, today we now have it in the cloud so people can share that same storage hardware or uh, individuals can have several devices that share the same uh, data sets. Same thing went on in networking, for example, with the virtual private networks where you might have a public network, but over that public network we can make it look like through software um, with the help of some hardware, you can make it look like you had your own private network. Same thing with uh, virtual LAN, uh, where you could have uh, a physical LAN, but you could have then a bunch of sub-LANs on it, so to speak, and everybody thought they had a separate local area network. Uh, it's also happened in applications. We see that today now with uh, containers like Kubernetes where the application thinks that it's got a computer to itself and you can move that container around different places and the application virtually sees you know, nothing else other than it thinks it's on, in its own little environment. Um, but all that flexibility, while it's great, you know, comes at a cost as we've uh, virtualized things more and uh, abstracted it away from the hardware, a lot of overhead starts creeping in and latency and maybe the hardware isn't as efficient. So now we've kind of swung the pendulum to the point where hardware is not necessarily working at its peak performance. And so this is an opportunity. So hardware acceleration, uh, on the other hand, addresses bottlenecks. And it's used to you know, speed up the execution of well-defined tasks. In fact, you know, accelerators, that really is their, their goal, is you've defined them to do something and they do that uh, 
particularly um, efficiently, low latency, high throughput. And we're seeing uh, within data centers now heterogeneous solutions with GPUs and FPGAs, which are aimed at accelerating things. So today's challenges, you know, where software is uh, dependent upon the hardware acceleration, it then becomes limited by the portability, because if the software is looking for a hardware accelerator, it has to run on the system where that hardware accelerator is. So if you tie it too closely um, to hardware now, you've limited yourself. And the other thing we would note is that CPUs uh, are limited often by DRAM. Uh, the performance is limited by how fast you can get to the DRAM. And so if you have an application that needs random access, DRAM's not so great at that. Um, so, you know, we're looking at now how are today's solutions accelerated? Certainly at the high level within a data center, we look at uh, solutions with OpenCL built upon uh, FPGAs and, and workload acceleration. We can look at GPUs with CUDA for accelerating things like image recognition. And those are very broad, high-level type things. Uh, there's also narrow uh, type acceleration that goes on today. Take, for example, uh, TCP offload engines, where what you're trying to do is uh, increase the throughput, perhaps reduce the latency of packets coming in over the TCPI protocol and handle that in, ha in hardware. So what about accelerating uh, other embedded tasks? And by this, I mean applications tend to be something that a user can see and utilize, but embedded tasks tend to be functions that are down inside the system uh, that are well-defined. They, they've got to be there, and you need to be able to control them and program them, but they're not the main application. But they can be, in fact, uh, a main limiter within the performance of a system. So if you look at the area of, for instance, in uh, networking, uh, and we look at things like packet filtering, there's different places where packet filtering can be utilized. And it would be nice for an application which is counting on packet filtering happening somewhere within the system uh, to be able to have some flexibility. And we, we call this uh, platform uh, portability. If you've got software, you'd like to be able to say if it relies upon some function down lower in the stack, that that software could be deployed in different environments but take advantage of a, an embedded function somewhere else. Uh, we could go from solutions where packet filtering is totally done in software on a server. And you know, one example of that is using something like DPDK, where at the application layer up above the OS kernel, that's where we're doing some uh, packet processing. Uh, that's a bypass type technology. It could be in the driver of the OS. It's embedded within the OS. And so we might look at things like a, um, you know, ACLs that are in Windows or Linux or Berkeley packet filtering type things where it's embedded in the driver. But to accelerate that, you might want to move it down into the hardware. So today we have things like smart NICs. And then those smart NICs might have offload silicon, um, such as something that Moses makes. And so packet filtering could be employed in all those different places. And wouldn't it be nice if that had the same functionality in every location? So if you had applications that required on that, now you could deploy that application many different places, and it wouldn't be tied to whether it was just hardware or just software. That's one of the things that we're going to talk about today. Another area where you could see packet filtering and um, you know, being able to utilize it now rather than a horizontal sort of picture, but in a vertical sort of picture. And that would be in the area of uh, things like switches, where you have maybe a software-defined network um, functionality implemented in an FPGA, which typically you might want to do with having some sort of fast path cache, where if you've seen the packet before, it just sails through. But if you haven't, now you have to go up to another level, see if you've got it in uh, a broader, maybe slower cache. And if it's not there, then you want to go through a packet classifier which is like a packet filter, uh, in essence, to identify, you know, is that packet one that we want to send through? Where do we want to send it? And then if it doesn't match there in that, you know, limited resources, maybe there's something more, uh, a broader uh, expression of the, um, the forwarding filtering database, and that would be up in a, a server, up in software. So now if it doesn't match on the FPGA. Now we have to push it up to the software level. 
and we want to go through the same sort of process. So it would be nice if it had the same uh, programming interface, for example, and the same implementation, so you always got the same results no matter what sort of level uh, you were doing it at. Um, OVS would be another one, or open virtual switches, which you know, has similar sort of flow caches, but eventually if you don't match in your cache, then you have to do some sort of packet classification. Uh, and if it doesn't exist in that uh, hardware domain, then you push it up to a software uh, server, right, which then can answer that same sort of question. So you'd like to have the same functionality, the same interfaces, if you could, across all those levels. <coughs> So we've developed this concept that most is called the virtual accelerator engine. And the idea is that it, it supports this trend towards, you know, virtualizing everything where it's uh, defined in software, can be controlled by software, so to speak. But what we've done is we've taken a particular function and we've abstracted it and made it virtual. And by that what we mean is defined precisely at the functional level, nothing to do with implementation. It's um, set up such that given the same inputs, it's going to have the same, produce the same results. And it's transparent to implementation. As you'll see later, uh, we want to be able to implement things in software, maybe implement this function in hardware, but it should be transparent to that. And it maps well into hardware because we want to have this function be something that we can accelerate. And it needs to be embeddable. I mean, what does that mean? Um, in my opinion, that means it makes use of natural boundaries in within a system that's at a lower sort of level. So you don't want to have something that spans a couple different boundaries or is fuzzy. It has nice, well-defined uh, edges. And so to that point, then, we have a common API uh, for programming it. We have a, a common RTL uh, module interfaces, and we'll talk about where those are and how those fit together. But they're, they're common across all implementations. And that allows them so software to come in and program it through the API, configure it, uh, interact with it, and it has the same sort of hardware interface so that you can now um, plug, sort of plug and play in many different kind of environments. And then there's always an adaptation layer that goes maybe from an existing higher level um, to down to this uh, software uh, API. And then um, lastly, it's a scalable uh, sort of uh, implementation. You know, at the lowest level, you want to have something that maybe runs on a software CPU type environment. And at the highest sort of level, you want to have something that can be implemented in FPGA or silicon, could be an ASIC, and then possibly with most of silicon at, at the very highest performance level. So it can be ported um, across existing uh, hardware now, and also it leaves room then for the future being able to uh, move it onto other platforms as new silicon technology comes available. So uh, the virtualizer accelerator engine scalability concept is that you have a well-defined interface, and you see here in the slide the little green boxes with the orange uh, outline. That is what we'd call the virtual accelerator interface, uh, which would be made up of, of this, uh, you know, this. RTL module sort of interface. And then what's below that then is the implementation. In the case of the software, it's just a software implementation, perhaps written in C. Um, and performance is uh, dependent upon the availability of DRAM to the CPU and the performance of that in a particular operation. Then you could have an FPJ version, which is just completely in RTL, making use of block RAM. That's the BRAM uh, rectangle there. Or you could be uh, have RTL making uses of uh, MOSIS's uh, bandwidth engine 2 with a very high access rate memory where it's taking on the function of the block memory but at a higher rate and a higher density. Uh, up to uh, a model maybe where it's uh, several of these virtual accelerator engines connected up to one um, uh, HBM high bandwidth memory um, stack. And there, uh, now we've scaled from 30 million operations, perhaps 300 to 600. Now we're up at, at 1.2 billion operations per second as probably limited in many cases by the access rate of the HBM. So the highest implementation here where the RTL is primarily a thin shell to allow you to pass commands into 
uh, MOSIS's programmable hyperspeed engine. We'll touch briefly on that later. But now all of the virtual acceleration logic and functionality and the memory technologies all in one piece of silicon that's you know, off of the FPGA chip, giving you the highest level of performance. But in all cases, across this whole line, given the same inputs, you'll get the same uh, results. And it's interesting, as I've kind of alluded to, um, for these types of problems typically that we're envisioning here, uh, memory access rate is the primary driver of performance. And just sort of words of the wise, the numbers that we show for operations per second, uh, they really are kind of what I call napkin calculations to give you a feeling for um, what the level of performance scalability will be. For each type of application, these numbers might scale up, down. They might be, you know, slightly different ratios to each other. But, but primarily, if you um, pull back the covers, because it's driven by the particular memory technology underneath, you'll see approximately this type of scaling. So I, I've talked a lot about the, uh, the interface to this, and so let's dive into that a little bit more. Uh, on this slide, you'll see that the control stack for this is up in the, typically a host CPU, or it could be an embedded CPU core in the FPGA or the silicon, but primarily we're thinking that it's up in the host CPU. has some sort of adaptation layer to the application um, that's controlling this thing, and then you have some sort of software adapter set of uh, code that then drives uh, the VA API, so the software. This is the edge at where it becomes now uh, specific to the particular accelerator engine. And now we cross over into the area where there would be some sort of hardware abstraction layer. Or in the case of purely software, then it's just purely software that comes down to our um, compute memory engine, which makes up the uh, runtime functionality of a virtual accelerator engine. And then wrapped around the outside of that, then, because we're now in a hardware domain, is a common uh, RTL interface or module interface. So think buses um, at this point here, where data and commands come in, some functionality happens, and then results are sent back out uh, on an output data bus. So it could be throw, um, a flow through type thing, uh, however, nothing says that you can also have a um, you know transactional sort of one where you can do reads and writes in, into this uh, block of logic. But fundamentally, uh, workloads are flowing in and results are coming out. Um, I'm going to touch briefly on sort of our highest accelerator engine technology, so we can get a feeling for. Um, what that might be at the highest sort of level, and this is the thing that was on the right-hand side of that scalability chart. Uh, MOSIS makes a programmable hyperspeed engine device, the piece of silicon that we sell that's for accelerating algorithms and data structures. At its core, there are 32 RISC processors that are tied tightly with a, a gigabit of uh, uh, one TS RAM or 128 megabits of uh, memory with ECC. And you can, theoretically, at the highest level, get 6 billion reads per second and 6 billion writes per second with 25 nanosecond latency. Um, and then also those 32 cores are tied uh, closely also through a cross-point switch to some scratch pad uh, SRAM, which gives you another 256 kilobytes of uh, memory with 12 billion transactions per second and 8 nanoseconds latency. So all of this you know, low latency High access rate is because everything's tightly contained on one piece of silicon, and it's been optimized for handling algorithms and data, the algorithms working on that particular data. But I'd like to pull it back up now to sort of the higher level sort of functionality, because part of the goal with a virtualized accelerator engine type thing is that you are talking at more of the software uh, sort of level and not getting involved in you know, what the underlying um, implementation technology is. So what's the benefit then of a virtualized accelerator engine? Well, in my opinion, it provides a wide range of performance and capacity uh, because memory um, can, uh, different technologies can scale from you know, 1 to 100. Uh, it, it enables a wider range of product SKUs because if you've built on top of this virtual sort of platform, 
uh, you can now substitute different memory uh, technologies underneath with, with execution. And it provides uh, easier adoption of hardware acceleration because you can define it in one case for just working purely software and now you can slip a piece of hardware underneath and then reap the benefits of that acceleration. It also then reduces time to deployment. I mean, one of the things nowadays as we've seen is the time to develop uh, RTL for ASICs and things like that. Um, to just, it just keeps expanding. Now it takes several years to be able to do something like that at, at its highest level of complexity. Well, if this has already been defined uh, as a virtual accelerator and then we implement <clears throat> that over on another piece of technology, what worked on a, a previous sort of software level now can be moved over to this area. And then because we've provided more of a software type uh, interface to that, I mean software engineers now can come in and change uh, the task that that's going to be uh, operating on. And that will become more apparent as I talk about our, um, the graph memory engine, which is our next topic here. Uh, and then it gives you platform portability. Any application that's made using this uh, can then be uh, migrated to other platforms that have a, uh, this particular virtual accelerator engine on that platform. So um, as a uh, provider of higher level type software, it just opens up the range of target uh, landing places where you can actually put your um, particular uh, application. So what it does for you then is it provides software uh, investment protection and that means that um, what you develop on one platform now could be used or utilized or amortized on another particular platform. And then at the end of the day then the programmers can take advantage of the software flexibility, but they get hardware uh, type performance without having to know what the underlying technology, whether it's firmware, whether it's RTL, or whether it's just purely C underneath. Uh, so that allows programmers then to focus on the bigger picture rather than the implementation picture. So I'm going to make a transition now. I talked about the virtual accelerator engine uh, concept and we view this as a technology and a family so to speak which then has various members under it. And the first one that we uh, have rolled out now is what we call the graph memory engine. So the graph memory engine uh, as we've defined it works on graphs. And so let's take a moment to define what a graph is in case you're not familiar with that. And, and what a graph is to a computer science person or a software person, it's something that you can describe where you have vertices or nodes that are tied together um, by edges or vectors, which in, in essence then creates relationships between the different nodes or vertices. And you can use that then to describe a lot of different types of problems. You know, computer science, people like to be able to go through then and figure out what is the most optimal representation of a particular problem in a graph. And they like to do things like prune the graph or add nodes into the graph. But at the end of the day when they're done, now we have a graph that you can use then to process um, other data. Uh, one of the ones that a lot of people are familiar with if they're familiar with things like grep on Linux is the regular expression sort of uh, problem where you have you want to draw a graph with characters and you can move around that graph and you can use that then to recognize certain words. Or, you know, in very, you know, undergraduate computer science things, you look at string matching with using partition trees. Or in the uh, networking world, we like to talk about longest prefix match for layer three. Those are all you typically expressed as a graph. And so we've left it at this sort of level, it could be a tree, it could be cycles where you can come back to the same node. Uh, we want to leave that very flexible. Uh, but at the root of it, what we want to be able to do is define nodes and then edges, and those edges in our um, terminology can be not just bytes, they can be single bits, they can be up to four bytes, for example. Which then leads me to, you know, so what is this thing then? So we have this uh, virtualized, uh, graph memory engine that you can express in a block diagram um, completely that shows that you have two pieces to it, a computation engine for computing you know, edge values 
and then you have a graph walker that takes those edge values and moves from one node to the next node to the next node. And once you have this sort of concept now, and if you define the different tests that you can do for computation purposes, then you can start to create a software framework around this where the host computer can come in, uh, program what's in the graph memory, then you can present it with something like a packet header uh, for a packet classification type problem where you look at the input bits in the packet header and you walk around the graph and then eventually you produce metadata. And that metadata then is information about things that you found in the packet header. So if it's the longest prefix match type problem that you're trying to solve here, it's the next hop uh, type information. If it's an access control list, maybe you only have one bit that comes out that says, you know, drop it, uh, and the default is forward it, for example. Uh, it's really up to the programmer then how you want to um, define that. And then the third input into this is the, or connection is the graph uh, ID. So you could have the concept then of being able to have multiple graphs inside of this uh, engine and therefore you could uh, query many different um, sorts of trees or graphs. And you can run things in parallel, for example. So the graph memory engine API, let's stop for a moment here. So I described a functional block. How do you build graphs? Well, now what you want to do is, and we spent some time researching this going on Wikipedia, on the internet, and looking around. You know, what you come back with is there's usually a common set of functions you want to build a graph. For instance, to define a node. So add a node to the graph, node n in this case. And then you provide some sort of um, edge computation uh, function that says, you know, how do you compute an edge value for a given a particular node? And then you want to take and string those nodes together. So you have add, add edge, end m in this case, using an edge value that you got out of your computation. And then from there, a bunch of support type functions, which was, uh, you know, things like, well, what if you don't match? Uh, what do you do? So add default edge. Um, you might ask the question, um, is the node in the graph? So, you know, have node, right, or has edge in the graph, or are there adjacent nodes to the one I currently got? So is there M adjacent to N? Or give me the list of neighboring nodes. Give me a list of the values. So you have all these sort support functions then for building up um, the graph. Once you have that API, now you can start to put together what we call, this is a product of ours, the packet classifier platform. So we have the graph memory engine with its API, and that forms this virtual accelerator engine, um, where through that API, then you can have up on the host CPU or the control CPU inside the uh, FPGA slash ASIC, can now then map uh, higher level type things like n-tuple searches um, into uh, a graph in the GME through the GME API. And so, for example, uh, at MOSIS, we have a, a TCAM compiler, we call a static TCAM compiler. So you can take a, a, a TCAM image that was generated, let's say, from a n-tuple, uh, and once you have that TCAM image, you can then compile that into a graph. And what's happening there is it's just edge by edge, it builds up a graph in the graph memory engine so that you can now um, head it, hand it packet headers and it will filter it. And then we have future uh, <coughs> classifiers that we will be uh, developing along this sort of n-tuple, where maybe now it can be more dynamic. One of the features of a graph memory engine is that you can dynamically add in edges, delete edges, uh, move edges around while you're searching within that engine. And so now that we've talked about all of this and we haven't touched on anything about how we implement it, whether that was software, firmware, um, RTL. So here's an example now showing how you might use the GME. Uh, and this comes out of our TCAM compiler uh, example. And in this uh, screenshot here, a little bit complex, but at the top, you read it from top to bottom. Uh, we took an, and said we wanted to test rule 100. So we pulled uh, entry 100 out of the TCAM. And if you're familiar with TCAMs, there's uh, don't care bits, uh, ternary bits, there's ones and there's zeros. And so a TCAM is kind of like a backwards SRAM. You provide the data and it tells you the location 
uh, that best matches the data that you gave it. So you're running the SRAM kind of in backwards. And you can see then it uh, time progresses or cycles progress from top to bottom. And in this particular case, the TCAM compiler built a graph, a tree, which it put in the memory, and that uh, graph uh, analysis uh, said start at the first uh, eight bits of the input, which we randomized uh, out of that, uh, that rule 100. Look at the first eight bits, and that will tell you what, what's the next field to go look at. And so then you'll see that it moved over um, to the first 32 bits, 8-bit field of, you know, 32-bit offset. And then it looked at another 16 bits, and it looked at another 8 bits. And eventually you see the blue rectangles. It's starting now to emit metadata that says, okay, we're finally now to the point where we've eliminated a lot of possibilities. Uh, rule 261 and 74 uh, could match at this point. And then it, you know, looks at some more bits, and then it goes back and it rechecks a few other bits that it hasn't looked at yet. And eventually it gets down to the point where it's eliminated all possibilities and says, okay, only thing left is uh, rule 0 and 100 will match. And then the results pop out at that point. Now we have a list of all the possible rules that could match, and voila, rule 100 uh, matches in this particular case. So it's not the only way to utilize this technology, not the only way to do a, a TCAM type functionality, but it should clearly shows how the graph memory engine can be utilized. So Moses has then been developing a packet classification platform. And you can see in the middle of that, the graph memory engine, and you can see at least four different examples of implementations from purely software to FPGA to FPGA using external uh, offload engines from Moses. You can see above it adaptation uh, software that we just talked about you know, earlier. Uh, with a TCAM compiler, future things to be defined, and also a block there for um, our customers. If you want to define your own graphs, uh, you can use our API. We fully publish that. I fully in, uh, encourage people to do that because you could come up with a lot of other functionality that doesn't even match a TCAM. Um, it could be, um, you know, go across many layers uh, of the ISO stack within the packet header, pulling things together, looking at things, and then below that. Uh, support silicon would be something like, you know, Xilinx FPJs, which we've been porting our uh, GME to, and, and in the future we will be supporting other uh, FPGA technology, uh, our own silicon, and then those are then uh, can be found in some of our own um, hardware development plane uh, platforms, as well as the DPDK on a CPU is, is another area where you could see the uh, this being uh, instantiated, or, you know, you as customers can define your own FPGA. We'll um, be able to provide the RTL to our graph engine that you could then instantiate in your own FPGA implementation. Uh, so uh, we have a board we call the Cheetah Card. It's an accelerator development kit. It has two by 100 uh, gig network uh, interfaces uh, on it. It's a clone of uh, Xilinx's VCU 1525. Uh, board. We took that schematic and we added our own silicon on there for the, the BE3, uh, which is our highest level of performance memory, and, uh, and or you can put in our programmable hyperspeed engine with the 32 risk cores and the memory all together. Uh, and then at the base, it has a PCI Express uh, bus here with eight lanes of Gen 3 uh, on it. And so this is really meant as a development uh, sort of kit, uh, which then we expect our customers to be able to adopt that. Uh, and then mold it into whatever particular hardware uh, environment that they need, but they can use this as a golden reference standard then to uh, develop from. And then we have software that runs on the host CPU to then talk to this hardware to allow you then to develop your uh, graph memory uh, engine. Uh, so what about the future? So I, I showed you the, uh, the graph processing thing. So. You know, something that's very uh, close to and it often expressed as graphs are things like machine learning. And in particular, what I'm thinking about here is data analytics. So it would be nice to be able to take data from, uh, let's say, network traffic, uh, either as a flow or eventually it could be as individual packets, and you gather that data, you then um, synthesize it down to some features, and then you could use something like a uh, 
a day analytics technique called random forest trees, for example, where you could analyze those features and then come up with um, projected uh, an analysis, right? Is this a threat? Is this flow of data a threat or is this packet a particular threat? Is it an anomaly? Does it fall outside of the normal sort of traffic? So that would be one example where we could define uh, a well-time uh, defined functionality that might be, let's say, a random forest to tree type uh, accelerator in this virtual technology. So in summary, uh, virtual accelerator engines can provide uh, software uh, hardware type speeds. It gives you scalability from 100 to 1 possible based upon the me underlying memory technology. It gives the OEM platform portability. So now if they have software that's built on top of this, uh, requiring this embedded function, they're not limited to uh, one particular instance, whether it's a specific piece of hardware or there or not. It provides um, software investment um, where a provision or preserve software investment so you can move many different places. And if new hardware comes about, uh, the underlying engine can be poured onto that. And now you can move that same software over. Um, and that really then gets you future proof, uh, proof to improvements in hardware acceleration. So Moses is then creating some of these application specific platforms uh, in this area of virtual technology. So look forward to seeing us uh, uh, provide more scalability or more depth in that particular area. Uh, we're always looking for things that need high throughput, low latency, high random access because that's you know an area that we feel very passionate about, feel that that's really the bottleneck in many different systems. And we think this is applicable to many embedded functions, which could be you know underlying things that are doing these search, searching and filtering um, type things, could you know get to sorting, uh, security, data analytics, as we just talked about, random forest of trees, uh, computing on sparse or random data. And what we're thinking about is you know, equipment such as embedded um, switching and routing, smart NICs, security applications, appliance um, servers. Um, you know, you're going to find these things, I think, emerging now in the 5G edge compute uh, sort of area. Uh, you know, certainly defense and aerospace is looking for ways that they can accelerate stuff. And test and measurement equipment might want to analyze data, so you want to have some sort of filtering on the fly to decide whether you're going to log something in or not. And certainly, you know, a lot of us are all focused on data center acceleration. So this is just an, an idea of the different types of equipment that we think this might be applicable to. So with that, Thank you. That's what I have for today, and I'd like to open it up to uh, questions and, um, you know, possibly answers. Hopefully. All right. Let's Thank you, away, Michael. For, thank you, Michael, for a great presentation. We're going to move on now to the question and answer portion of our event. But as a reminder, please fill out the feedback form that we'll open up at the end of the show. Thank you in advance for filling out the feedback form. Your participation in this survey allows us to better serve you. We're going to now move on to the question and answer portion of our event. If you'd like to participate in our Q&A session, simply type your question into the text box located to the right of the presentation window, or click on the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen, type your question in, and then click the Submit button. We'll get to as many questions as we can in the time that we have left. If we don't get to your question today, someone will get back to you after the program is over. So let's get started with some questions here for you, Michael. Got several coming in. Uh, the first one here says, can you expand on the topic of future-proofing? Yeah, so future proofing, you know, it, what that means to me is can I do something today and uh, invest in some software or an architecture and be assured that uh, in the future, if new technology comes about, that I can take advantage of that. And so by creating this, um, this division between uh, and abstracting, right, a particular functionality, that means given that abstract definition, I can create uh, an application using that abstract definition without knowing the implementation. And that means now that I can then uh, slide underneath it, you know, other uh, implementations, which might uh, have different characteristics. It might, you know, have more capacity. It might have more performance. And so really the key is this virtual uh, abstract um, functionality. All right, thank you, Michael. We've got another question here that says, 
uh, what's this going to take for me to implement this technology? So the way this works is that uh, we will provide uh, a set of RTL uh, that's been, you know, uh, ported to particular, let's say, FPGA, where we know it closes timing is functional, and so we would provide then a module that has uh, these well-defined uh, interfaces. We'd expect then a customer to take that particular module, and then it, there would be have to be some sort of uh, hardware abstraction layer channel that needs to be, you know, implemented for the the customer's specific you know, implementation. So uh, it might be just as simple as a set of wires that come from another portion of the FPGA to, to form that bridge from the API to the end of the memory. Or it could go across in our case of like the Cheetah card, we're going across the PCI Express bus. Uh, so there's a, a tunnel function there across PCI that gets inserted. Uh, neither the higher level software nor the graph memory engine know anything about it, but it provides this link um, so that would be another example of something then that, that you know needs to be inserted in there. But that's probably the area where the um, you know the hardware software work needs to be done specific to the implementation. Other than that, above that is the API, and then we have example applications that run on that, as well as then the customer can create their own. All right, thank you, Michael. We have another question for you here that says, uh, how is the Mosis solution? different from other accelerator technologies? So that's, you know, it's an interesting question, kind of a, you know, what's the philosophy of that particular accelerator um, engine? You know, a lot of accelerator engines have been, and it really comes back to you know, what problem you're trying to solve. Um, <clears throat> they may have been aimed at a particular application level type um, problem. So that could be one type of accelerator, and so it does it means that you program it for a narrow but specific you know, application set. And you really expect more of the user at the higher level to be able to, to program that. And so that's one case. And, and I would put CUDA running on top of GPUs in that particular case. Um, in my opinion, what we're doing here is a particularly embedded type function. So we are focusing on more at the system architect who's looking to accelerate and make use of a particular function running faster. And so our accelerator is aimed at that. But then what distinguishes that different than, let's say, other um, silicon providers? Other silicon providers look at uh, supporting just their own silicon, and that's what their uh, SDK is set up to do. So in this case, what we're providing is a function that is implemented in many different ways, from uh, RTL and an FPGA to software to something that's in firmware. It's all the same accelerator, but with different expressions. And so it gives you a much wider range of uh, portability and uh, usability, which I think then uh, distinguishes it from other uh, accelerator type technology. All right, thank you, Michael. And just as a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question, just go ahead and click on the Q&A icon, type your question in, and then click the Submit button. We'll get to as many as we can. Uh, looks like we have just one more question for you here. Uh, it says, how will future silicon technology play into this? So here, I think that really, really the key is that we're looking for uh, technology uh, which addresses the random access rate, so we're looking for other memory technologies, and it could be in embedded type uh, technologies. It could be as process nodes shrink down, you know, and that sometimes, you know, brings the compute closer to the memory, sometimes that, you know, you're able to pipeline the memory more. And as we see these evolving, and you can see that, you know, the FPGA companies clearly are, are pushing the envelope uh, on their uh, process nodes. Uh, I would see us then, uh, for instance, porting to those various process nodes this particular acceleration uh, engine functionality. Uh, so really there is only limited, I believe, by the ability of uh, you know, future process uh, nodes and the ability of 
uh, both ASIC and FPGA manufacturers to take advantage of it, we can move our accelerator technology on that. All right. Well, thank you, Michael. That looks like uh, all the time that we have for questions for today. If we did not get to your question today, someone will get back to you after the program is over. And for more information related to today's webinar, please visit any of the resource links available in the green folder icon at the bottom of your screen. Within the next 24 hours, you will receive a personalized follow-up email with details and a link to today's presentation on demand. Once again, we'd like to thank you for attending today's webinar, Scaling Software Defined Networking, or SDN Applications, with the MOSIS Virtualized Accelerator Engine. Brought to you by Tech Online and MOSIS. This webinar is copyright 2019 by Aspen Core. The presentation materials are owned by or copyright by Tech Online and MOSIS, and the individual speaker is solely responsible for his content and opinions. On behalf of our guest and MOSIS, I'm Chris Keach. Once again, we'd like to thank you for joining us, and we hope you have a great day.